In today's episode, I'll present to you the extraordinary history of Lithuania. I will take on the challenge of making this country an economic hegemon in less than 100 years. To become a hegemon, I need to earn 1000 gold per month. Currently, I'm earning 14.5 gold and I'm in the red. Additionally, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania is truly an underdeveloped country. It's mired in conflict between Orthodoxy and Catholicism, which makes it an easy target for conquest by the Grand Duchy of Moscow or the remnants of the Golden Horde. And in a few years, its only potential ally, Poland, will also attempt to politically subjugate Lithuania. Luckily for me, there's a hidden mission in Lithuania's mission tree, which will allow me to develop this country incredibly fast. And after forming the Lithuanian Commonwealth, I'll reach the status of economic hegemon much sooner than you'd expect. Intrigued? So, Iron Man, let's play! Welcome, imperialists! Lucas here! Lithuania is ruled by Grand Duke Kazimierz Jagiellon. Alright, maybe he has some nice traits, but he definitely wasn't a good military leader. That's why I'm already looking for a successor. Which is costly. A 336 8 year old. Perfect. Well, maybe not completely, but I won't complain. For a start, that's a pretty decent heir. I'm switching my focus to military affairs. It will come in handy. Very much so. Next, I'm dealing with social estates. We initially have four, as the Cossacks have joined, which makes my cavalry stronger. At first, I took the following privileges. Cheaper administrative advisor. Fits perfectly. I quickly form an alliance with Bohemia because I noticed they are rivaling Poland. The Brandenburgers might also come in handy as a future Lithuanian ally. I'm not choosing rivals yet, I don't want Poland to make any alliances. They will be one of our first rivals anyway. I also begin the process of converting one of those Orthodox provinces because I'm going to abandon Catholicism and switch to Orthodoxy. For what I'm planning for Lithuania, this is simply a much better religion. Besides, I already have a lot of it in my country, all those striped territories. From what I see, there's a lot of autonomy in southern Lithuania. And even more in the north, who would have guessed? Anyway, I reduce autonomy everywhere, we want to lower it across the country as quickly as possible. And most importantly, I'm lowering missionary maintenance. I want the orthodox rebellions to happen as soon as possible. Orthodox rebels have appeared. Awesome! I can now adopt this religion as the main one in my country. Taking that land earlier was a very foolish decision. Doesn't matter, I replayed it and did it correctly. That 5% is important. Now I have far fewer provinces to convert. And even if I start paying missionaries, conversion won't take too long. Unfortunately, Lithuanian provinces are so poor that I can't consecrate a metropolitan anywhere. No matter, everything else is done. Now we just have to wait until the Polish-Lithuanian Union arises, or at least its proposal, because then I'll be able to complete that mission. Think I forgot about some privilege. Oh well, I'll grant it later when we seize Crown Land. By the way, I'm not planning to ally with Novgorod. It would most likely drag me into an early war with the Muscovites, and I don't want that. While waiting for the event, I'm building a spy network in Poland. This will speed up the siege of several of their fortresses. Is it time to restore the Polish-Lithuanian Union? No, we can't risk my independence. Fortunately, Poland doesn't have any strong allies. Since the Lithuanian armies have zero professionalism, I recruit a large mercenary company and a free company before the war. It will be cheaper than maintaining a regular army. Just do the math. I demand the Polish crown and declare Poland as a Lithuanian rival. I appoint my generals and surprisingly the best one is the ruler himself. With a bit of luck, maybe he'll die sooner. And with that I invade Poland. For now, without Czech assistance. First, I let the Poles enter my fortresses to crush their army there. Although I suffered much heavier losses, for sure. It went a little better under Smolensk. And near Podolia, after crushing the Polish army, apart from gaining siege progress, I also managed to break through the walls. That's good because I could assault. 81 days and Podolia fell. And shortly after, I crushed half of the Polish army, or maybe the Mazovian one. Yes, Mazovian, because they don't have an army here. With Poland so weakened and without an army, they became an easy target. And I began the sieges of both Krakow and Warsaw, simultaneously. And shortly after, when I gained the support of both Bohemia and Brandenburg, I called both countries into the war, just to speed up the sieging of the fortresses. Rebellions are also approaching, and someone will need to suppress them. As I said at the beginning, this country has a lot of rebellion problems. And and after a while, I made peace with Poland, making them my personal union, and I took almost 500 ducats from them, with 300 going to me. That war was pretty bloody for me. Now I could continue marching west, but I'd rather let my next ruler get those bonuses in three years. After the war with Poland, I did the following. I removed all the cavalry from my army and disbanded it. I simply can't afford it. I prefer to have mercenaries for now to suppress rebellions. Although there aren't many at the moment, there will soon be a second, third, fourth and fifth wave. After this war, I'll definitely 
have some economic problems for a while, because I'll need to spend a lot on mercenaries. Okay, now that I've dealt with autonomy, because it's zero during peacetime since I have 10% crown land, I'm reducing autonomy everywhere. I want to get rid of this modifier from my country as soon as possible. Maybe for now, I've turned Lithuania into France, or more modernly, Great Britain, but in time, this will really pay off. I totally didn't expect this. <laughs> they practically committed suicide. The Teutonic army is crushed, and I won't even call in allies for this war. The Renaissance has appeared in the world, great. The best part is that I'm defending Mazovia and Poland here, but since they are disloyal vassals, they are not participating in this war. Teutonic army is gone, I crushed them near Gdansk. This war is much easier than I thought, and it just got more complicated. <coughs> No matter, I've called for help from the Czechs, I've just wiped out the Danish armies, they shouldn't have joined this war, and shortly after Sweden declared a war for independence. Well played, 500 IQ move. Honestly, I'm lucky in the war with the Danes because England is also involved here, which gives me naval dominance, or rather, the Swedes have naval dominance, but I'm taking advantage of it and heading straight for the Danish capital, which will allow me to take quite a bit of money from the Danes as well as war reparations. I'll end the war as follows. Sure, there's a small coalition threat, but it won't form because there won't be five countries able to join, but gaining access to the Baltic is absolutely worth it. After converting my capital to orthodoxy, I'm developing it mainly with diplomatic points to at least level 30. Level 30 because that will give a decent boost to renaissance growth. But since I've captured Gdansk, I want to introduce the renaissance as quickly as possible. That's why I'm developing this province even more. After all these wars, I'm even making a profit, and not just from subsidies. That's why I'm now focused on paying off my loans. As for government reforms, aside from being a really grand duchy that can get even grander, I'll focus on tax income. And where was it? Ah, here. Besides, this will weaken the nobility. After conquering Poland, I'm now one of the largest countries in the world. So I'll be looking for alliances with countries like France or the Ottoman Empire. Everyone else is just potential land to conquer. And Moscow, I'll treat them as a bank as usual. They just need to grow by a few surrounding principalities. Because at this point, they won't give us much money. I also introduced institutions which allowed me to develop the fifth military technology earlier, which is really good because it gives me an advantage in unit quality. Although the sixth one is even better. And actually, using my technological advantage, I'll humiliate Russia. I mean, I'll use that Casus Belli because I don't have another one yet. I'll start by attacking their rebels because they almost captured a fortress near Moscow, and I break their army without any problem. Oh Jesus, Russia has so many vassals here, I think I know why I always prefer to attack them after integrating all of this. During the war with Russia, I managed to introduce faceting of course in Gdansk, which will greatly strengthen my trade in that region. Oh, I'm not the only one attacking Moscow. Why do I still have such major uprisings, even my nobilities? Unfortunately, because of those stupid rebels, I had to end the war with Russia, but I forced that country to invest in my own. Rebels crushed, and at this point, I can abdicate my ruler. Jogaila ascends the throne. And that's good, because now I can really strengthen this ruler. By the way, I also did right by the Cossacks. Now all I have to do is strengthen my ruler. I just need to stabilize the situation in the country. Or rather, deal with the huge autonomy. I'll also take advantage of Denmark being weakened at the moment and push my claim to the Livonian order. As usual, heart appears when I declare war. Oh, and with France as well. I hope I don't forget to form alliances with these two countries. With the fourth administrative technology, I can choose the first idea for Lithuania. And for me, there's no better one than the aristocratic idea. Very quick access to development, increased manpower, but most importantly, I'll have reduced autonomy. I also purchased icons for cheaper development and construction in my country, although aggressive expansion was tempting at times too. But no, I'll mainly be developing Lithuania here. Plus, I can build churches very cheaply at this point. I conquered the entire region of Courland. I conquered Riga because generally it's easier to develop it to level 30 when you own it yourself. In fact, it's cheaper to develop it to level 30. Just make sure before hand that Riga has no territorial claims to the Prussian region. I also formed both alliances with France and the Ottoman Empire. Now I'm probably very safe. After those conquests, I also moved my main trade to the Baltic region. Funny, Moscow lost two provinces after the first war with Kazan, but also a vassal. A few years later, I managed to pay off the last of my loans, which allowed me to peacefully start building churches in my country and peacefully deal with rebels. I also built a trade fleet, which I'll send to protect trade in Novgorod. The naval doctrine is the one that increases my trade power. And now that I'm finally making money, I issued edicts to lower autonomy because I have it very high and the average autonomy can not exceed 10%. The first development from the era is aggressive expansion. It will be useful to me. As the next tax reform, I chose taxes, although I was very tempted to go for decentralized estates. However, at this point, Lithuania has a very high income from taxes, so it's nice to increase it by half. I just don't have many provinces where I can issue edicts and a dumb heir was born, oh well.
Only now did I notice that Kazan has taken over Moscow's vassals. Only Pskov remained loyal. After 20 years, I'm switching my focus to administrative. Although I haven't fully developed my ideas yet, the next one will be an administrative idea. I also managed to reduce the average autonomy in my country below 10%. Yes, even though I have a province with 43%, it's really about the average. And in some guides, they say it's about 10% in all provinces. So now, let the nobility support grow. And finally, I can stabilize the situation in my own country. I satisfied the clergy. Maybe not not the best heir, but I won't complain about him, and he'll continue the traditional name Jogaila. Meanwhile, I supported the Ottoman Empire in its war with Karakoyunlu. I won't surprise you, at the next level, I'm taking infrastructure ideas. They combine perfectly with aristocratic ideas. Because the final development lowers the costs of developing provinces, and along the way, also cheaper building construction. After helping the Ottomans, I attack Moscow. Moscow without vassals is much weaker, and it can still give me almost 800 ducats of investment in my country. The only problem I have with Moscow right now is that Ivan III the Great is ruling there. But, fortunately, the air is terrible. So I capture Moscow, then I plunder it. In this episode, I haven't burned it yet, until now. And as I said, at the moment, I'm only interested in investments. Because my country is already too big anyway. I can't, for now, with all the bonuses, I'm getting 65 gold per building. And that's still not the lowest building costs I can get. That's why I'm building workshops everywhere. In the case of Lithuania, I'll be building them literally everywhere, because there's a mission called Industrialize Lithuania, which gives me an increase in production by one for having a manufactory in every province. That's quite a lot. Despite my best efforts, Russia has grown into a great power. I've also managed to significantly reduce autonomy across most of my territories. A level of 10% autonomy is enough for now, therefore I'm replacing the edicts that reduce autonomy with those that will increase my tax income. And just like that, I'm making 10 more Ducats. This is also a good moment to release Riga as my vassal. With 30 development points and enough buildings, Riga can now complete the two missions, the city against the state and develop our city. These give Riga incredibly powerful bonuses. Just remember in the end to make sure Riga transfers trade to me. In the meantime, I've begun developing my Lithuanian territories again, mainly using diplomatic points. I'll also take advantage of icons for cheaper construction and I'll start building manufactories everywhere, prioritizing the highest amounts first. Honestly, it's even worth taking out some extra loans for this purpose. I then attacked Russia again, aiming primarily for money, but this time I'll take some territory as well. However, this war won't be as easy because Ivan the Great reigned for quite a long time, although he just died a moment ago, which might set Russia back once again. I also completed the mission for religious settlements, which gave me a very cheap inquisitor. I immediately dismissed the previous one and hired this new inquisitor who works for half the price. I even invested in his education. I can also establish a Jesuit academy now. How nice. Too bad I didn't take this option earlier. But back to Russia. I easily crush Moscow's armies and position my forces between Novgorod and Moscow. Honestly, I'll let Poland handle the rest from here. They're doing a good job wiping out Moscow's armies until they just lost a battle. Oh no, Poland. I wanted to praise you for once. Well, at least they avenged themselves in the next battle. I'm temporarily satisfied with this peace deal. I've had some luck in this campaign. The era transition to the religious era has begun and Protestantism emerged quickly in the Netherlands. I've also decided to end my alliance with the Ottoman Empire. My missions lead me to conquer all of Crimea, so eventually I'll have to go to war with them. Finally, I've maxed out my national ideas, which gave me another reduction in development costs. As a result, I've decided to initiate the Lithuanian Golden Age. I will also complete the mission to introduce the Magdeburg Laws. And I'm attacking the Teutonic Order, as I found out I need to capture their capital, Marienburg, for one of my missions. Since I'm close to reaching the maximum amount of military and diplomatic points, I'm changing the everywhere to those that promote development. Oh, I forgot to explain the secret of this mission. Lithuania's national ideas now include a bonus to province development, making it one of the best countries for playing tall in Eastern Europe. Plus, there's a bonus to goods production. The Teutonic Order is gone, an easy war. Look at some of my province development costs. They are incredibly low, just 6 points per development level. Now it's time to focus on developing provinces with Lithuanian culture. First, I need 175 development points there. For that, I'll use infrastructure in the best provinces. Developing past level 15 for 10 points is a bargain. This will allow me to complete the Enforce a Commonwealth mission, upgrading my country to a kingdom and lowering development costs again for 10 years. I've managed to accumulate a large capital by selling land and taking loans and further reduce the cost of my buildings. Check this out. 52 gold per building, which is practically free. Well, 
at least half the usual cost. So I've stacked up a lot of modifiers for development, cheaper buildings, cheaper advisors and cheaper technology which I'll use in Lithuania right now. Look at how much development I have at the moment. How much will I have in 10 or 20 years? Wait, why do these modifiers apply to Polish provinces too? Since when do Lithuanian modifiers work on vassals and personal unions? I'm not complaining though. This will allow me to develop Poland cheaply before integrating it for free. I've even managed to lower development costs to just 5 points per development level. Wow. I've also adopted a new form of government, the Grand Kingdom, which allows every religion in my country to be accepted. I also have increased governing capacity and more. In a very short time, I've nearly doubled my income just by developing my provinces. Unfortunately, my ruler, who provided really cheap buildings, just died, so the cost of building manufactories has gone up a bit. Meanwhile, I'm at war with Bohemia, but this is mostly a war for France. The Reformation era has begun and that's fine, because soon I'll transform into the Commonwealth and get a production bonus. My new ruler is an architectural visionary, which means he'll build buildings cheaply. That's pretty cool. Of course, I forgot to spend all my administrative development points before the era change. Sometimes I'm so dumb. Luckily, I was still able to build manufactories for less than 300 gold, so I'm taking full advantage of that while I can. Right now, I'm building a lot of farms. After increasing my stability, I can advance my missions much further. Wait, what am I missing now? Ah, I have a mission to develop Poland. So be it. I am fully maximizing the remaining time of these three years to develop my provinces at a very low cost. I'm even allowing myself to fall behind in technology, as I'll catch up on that later. The chance to develop provinces at such a low cost is just too good to pass up. Sadly, in April 1512, the era of cheap development ended. Now, the minimum cost is 21 points. It's a shame, but it doesn't change the fact that I've grown by over 300 development points in just 10 years, without any conquests. As well as the crown land in my country, which is truly massive. I also managed to assign metropolitan bishops everywhere, giving me nearly the maximum bonus from the Patriarchate, which significantly boosts my manpower. After introducing the institution, I finally catch up in technology. For my third set of ideas, I choose trade ideas. Though, for future actions, a good alternative might be quantity ideas to increase my army and manpower limits or espionage ideas. Since the Ottoman Empire is currently bleeding out in Crimea, literally losing all its manpower, I had no choice but to prepare my armies for war. I now have Lithuanian Hussars, which are a bit worse than the Polish ones, but still very good. In fact, my army currently looks like this. 14,000 infantry, 8,000 juicy winged Hussars or Cossacks, and 10,000 artillery. I could raise another army, but I'm close to the limit, so for now, I think this army will suffice. With this preparation, I invade the Ottoman Empire, where my goal will be to capture Crimea, right? Oh, Kirim, let France help me in this war. You know what's the best part? I forgot to form the Commonwealth. And Crimea fell after 200 days of siege, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, Polish provinces started to fall in the meantime, so I had to pull my army back toward Warsaw, where the quality of the Ottoman army was better than mine, but I had more troops in the area. For now, oops, I'll have to retreat. Though the French have arrived to help, who will win this great battle for survival? For the future. Will it be the Eastern civilization, or the Western, or Lithuanian, and the Ottomans retreated? But I suffered fewer losses in this battle, fortunately. The best part is that the Ottoman army can't retreat to their homeland, so they'll be a very easy target for us. Beautiful, the entire Ottoman army is destroyed. Well, half of it is destroyed, but still, it's a great victory for Poland. So great that my troops are now at the gates of Constantinople, and Constantinople fell faster than Warsaw. The first Ottoman ally says goodbye to this war, and the second ally says goodbye too. Though I did take one province from them, that will come in handy. Normally, the first development in this era would be the Polish crown, but I haven't formed the Commonwealth yet. So to not waste time and use this war against the Ottoman Empire, I'll take religious wars. I'll choose the Polish crown as my next development. Another great bloody victory for the West. That's how it will surely be written in the Chronicles. Now, I'm closing in on the Ottomans at two straits, and I win the war shortly after, capturing a good chunk of Crimea as well as a decent sum of money from the Ottoman Empire. In the next war, I'll simply take the rest. I didn't expect the French navy to be so useful in my short war against the Danes, just like my eastern borders will be expanding quite a bit in the near future. My economy looks pretty good, though I'm still quite a ways from hitting 1000, but that doesn't change the fact that it's time to integrate the wealthy Polish territories into it, or maybe not just yet. I'll just complete this mission first. After developing my trade ideas, I now need to cheaply advance my technology, because I've already adopted the policies and they are really valuable. An additional merchant and increased production of goods. And since I already have manufacturing 
factories for cloth and iron, I'm building them everywhere. I hope I've taken all the modifiers for cheaper construction. I wonder how much my income will increase once I've built manufactories all across my country and activated the golden crown. I also expanded cloth production in the Slak province, I believe. Yes, that's correct. In that province, I literally built manufactories in every province I could. The remaining ones require the 14th level of technology. I'll start building them in Poland too. And that moment when I've started building manufactories everywhere in Poland as well. All right, I've built manufactories everywhere in my territory. Almost everywhere. Whatever. That's why I think Lithuania is now an industrialized region. I forgot to check how much development I had before. Doesn't matter. What I'm doing now is declaring war on the Ottoman Empire because I want to complete this entire chain of missions before forming the Commonwealth. Yes! There's a surprise for you in this mission, but I'll tell you about that later. Constantinople fell, and Władysław I Platter ascended the throne. This war will be much easier because, at the same time, the Mamluks declared war on the Ottoman Empire, and the whole war ended in my victory, along with some territorial gains. Thus, all of Crimea was conquered by me. And honestly, I'm going to make use of the benefits of the Cossacks here. But I'm still lacking prestige, so I sent claims to those minor principalities around Moscow, to march in and shortly after annex them into Lithuania. And from this point on, Lithuania has joined the European game of powers, where, in addition to all power costs being reduced by 5%, there's a barely readable message informing you that I fooled you at the beginning of the video. I'll only need 500 gold to establish myself as an economic hegemon. Meanwhile, I went overboard with my conquest. Now I can peacefully form the Lithuanian Commonwealth. And I definitely want the new traditions and ambitions, because they're simply better than the Lithuanian ones. Strangely, after forming Lithuania Poland, I have to manually switch to the Grand Empire, though maybe that's for the best. Still, I lost 50 points. The the Grand Empire is better in that our monarch will be better in administrative points. I also have spare governing capacity, so I can add the newly acquired Polish territories as states. And I received the entire Polish mission tree, though unfortunately I lost the Lithuanian one. Nevertheless, I'll now get a lot of economic missions. Develop Ruthenia, tend to the east, but the most important is the middle path, which requires me to move my capital to Warsaw. Hello, hello. Ah, rebels, there you are. Next, I increase the price of grain after moving the capital. I also need to develop some of these provinces here, three times. I don't know why I can't complete this mission. Very strange. I can finally adopt the Polish crown. That's the entire region of Poland. Almost everywhere the unrest is at zero or less. Only here it's 0 0.2. Across all of Poland, autonomy is at a minimum zero. And as I click through all these provinces, the lowest level is 14 or 10. Well, maybe I'll increase this 13 a bit. Which means every single province was increased at least three times. And yet I still can't complete the mission. Never mind, I'll try to take Silesia from the Czechs. Maybe that will trigger it. An easy war, Silesia is mine. I even restored Krakow, but it still doesn't change anything because I can't complete the mission. Oh, why is that? If I had completed this mission, I would have easily had over 500 income, which would allow me to trigger the economic hegemon. Do I need the military one? Though I'm close to the military hegemon as well, I'll just conquer another piece of Sweden for that, and I'll add those newly acquired provinces to a trade company. And after a while, I managed to have over 500 income which allows me to trigger the economic hegemon. And I'm also very close to the military hegemon, so take your pick, I did it, only 11 years late. And that's because I couldn't click the mission. After reloading the game, I could finally complete the mission. I expanded the monument in Krakow and in Dalaskogen, which significantly increased my influence. And the entire Lithuanian territory has developed significantly. Ah, poor Scandinavia. And in this video, you can watch as I create a super powerful Aztec nation. Additionally, I'm invading Europe. 